I remember when I was young, I was, um, I was watching TV, I think, and there was a cartoon on, and there was a character who was in the quicksand, and then um, they, were, they found out they were sinking, and they started to struggle to try and get out of the quicksand, and they fell down in, and sunk right down into the quicksand, and, and they died. And I, was, and I was quite young, and I was a bit terrified, and I thought, oh my goodness, like, what is quicksand? And I lived in Palmerston North at the time, did my primary school years, my family, we lived down there, and we used to go for walks along the Manawatu River. And um, there was often little sandy bays or like little areas of kind of mud and we would play in them. And I thought, oh no, like what if there's quicksand there? Like what if I drown in the quicksand? And it became this kind of thing of like, oh no, quicksand. I didn't know it was a thing, but what if I get stuck in it? But anyway, when I was um, uh, uh, thinking about communion this week, for some reason that, that thought came into my mind about quicksand. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. And you know, the thing with quicksand is if you, if you want to get out, like if someone wanted to get rescued on these TV shows that I was watching, the, the, they would say, stay still. Like, don't panic. Don't try and get out. Stay still. Because the more you move, the more that you sink into the sand. So they'll say, stay still. Don't freak out. We'll throw you a rope and we'll pull you out of the sand. And so I thought, okay, you've got to make sure if I ever find myself in quicksand, don't panic. Stay still and just let them pull me out. Anyway, what the heck has that got to do with what we're doing right now? Well, I thought, well, there's a bit of a connection here. With when, we, when we find ourselves sometimes in a mess, you know, um, in, a, in a mess of sin or in something that we've got ourselves into in life, how often do we react in panic? And do we think, okay, oh heck, I'm in trouble. I've, I've sinned or we might be confronted with something and we might be convicted of something and we think, I've got to get out of this mess. Like, especially if God's watching, right? Like, God, uh-oh, he sees me, and I, I've done this thing, and now I realize I've done it. Quick, clean yourself up before God sees you. Or he's looking, you better get out of the sand and, and show him that you're sweet. And so we panic, and we try and move and move, but what happens is we fall more and more down into the quicksand. And what's happening, what's the real thing we should be doing is, is staying still, right? If we're in the quicksand, we should stay still. We should reach out. We should realize that the more we struggle, the more we sink. But if we stay still and if we reach out to Jesus... He will pull us out. If we're in the mess of sin and we're struggling to try and clean ourselves up, trying to get out of the hole, we're only going to make it worse. We need to stay still. We need to look to Jesus and ask him to pull us out of the mess, right? And what we hold in our hands this morning, this communion, represents the blood and the body of Christ. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? While we were sinners, while we were in the quicksand, while we were struggling and freaking out, realized we're sinful, he died for us. He didn't die once we got out of the sand. He died while we were in there. And that was, what was that for? To pull us out. To say, look, I see you're in the mess. I see you're scared. I'm here. Just reach out. Just grab my hand and let me pull you out. Don't try and do it in your own strength. And this morning, let's have communion as a reminder that, you know, when we go through life, you know, I don't know what people are going through right now. You might be in a mess or you might not. But when we go through life, we're going to find ourselves in these situations all the time, aren't we? Confronted with our sin, realizations that, oh, heck, I've messed this up. But the answer is not to panic and to try and get ourselves out of the situation. It's to look to Jesus, to grab his hand, to accept his grace and accept him to pull us out of that mess and set us free. So this morning as we take communion, let's remember that and let's thank Jesus um, for, for providing his arm, his grace, his freedom, is pulling us out, and, to, and as a remi- let's remember also to relax, to trust that it's His strength that's not ours. No matter how much we fight, it's not going to help. He's the one that pulls us out. Sound good? Let's remember that this morning as we take and as we, we drink and eat. But I'd love to pray. Let's join together and pray and then, um, and then take the emblems together. Father God, we thank You that You are um, our life support. You are our, our grace. You are our Savior, Lord. You've saved us from the mess of sin. You've saved us from the mess that our souls are in because we are sinful people, Lord. But you've saved us from situations that we know we'll come up against as well where we battle with sin. And you've saved us by your grace, Father God. And we worship you for that. We thank you for that. We thank you that as you pull us out, you create in us um, a new spirit. You create us, you you bring us into, into purity and into relationship with you. And we love you and worship you for that. So, Lord, we just still our hearts this morning. We thank you that no matter how much we mess up, no matter what messes we find ourselves in, you're there. You're wanting to reach your hand out, and you're wanting to pull us out. 
So we reach to you this morning. We look to you. We grab your hand afresh. And we ask you to pull us closer to you, Lord, closer to your heart, and uh, make us more like you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, feel free to take the communion in your own time and just reflect. And um, yeah. everyone, Steph here with this week's Surfside News. And first of all, a big welcome to all the holiday makers visiting this week. And our sincere apologies for the weather that has been a blend of wet, damp, drenching, sopping and soaking. We hope that week one of the holidays has nevertheless been a happy and memorable one for you. And to the teachers and students, we hope you're already feeling relaxed. Alright, here's this week's news. First of all, a massive congratulations to one of our very own, Marion Wright. In December, Marion finished her diploma in Christian Leadership, and last weekend up at Alpha Cruces College in Auckland, she celebrated her graduation along with fellow students and her family. Well done, Maz! Secondly, the Ignite Youth Leadership team kicked their holiday off with a camp down at Lake Rotuiti. A massive thank you to Julie MacDonald for hosting the group of 12 Surfsiders at her batch down at the lake. The team had an epic time exploring waterfalls, caves and hot pools, as well as getting inspired by guest speaker who talked about hearing from God and the prophetic. Well, that's it for this week's holiday news. Up next, we have the final in our current series, Signs of the Times, a look at biblical prophecy with Pastor Roger. If you've missed any of the series or would like to revisit past messages, you can do so via surfsite.co.nz or check out our Surfside Church YouTube channel. But until next time, enjoy the rest of the service and the second week of the holidays. Back to you, Pastor. Father, we do thank you for, for your word. Lord, we thank you that um, you love to speak to us through your word. And so we just open our hearts and our minds right now and Lord we want to hear you hear your voice this morning and so I just pray that this word that you've laid on Roger's heart the the end of this the rounding up of this series Lord that you'll um, continue to speak to us continue to to challenge us and grow us and um, show us fresh revelation and so we just commit this time to you now Place it in your hands, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as, as uh, you've heard, we're concluding our little series today. And um, I guess we've, we've followed a few threads, haven't we, over the last few weeks in different areas. And I think um, we need to understand that the return of Jesus, it's not just my idea, not just some random pastor from somewhere. This is a dominant theme actually right through the Bible that Jesus not only came to save us at the cross and went through, but he's coming back. And um, just for, for just some really uh, important information for you, there was 1,845 1, different Bible references to the fact that Jesus is coming back. So it's mentioned quite a few times in the Bible. 17 out of 39 Old Testament books refer to the coming of the Lord and uh, that, that period of time. 23 out of 27 New Testament books return, uh, refer to the return of Jesus. In fact, 7 out of 10 chapters in the, in the entire New Testament refer to the return of Jesus. So it is quite a dominant theme, isn't it? I mean, we think about the theme of, of course, of salvation, you know, from, from the beginning when Adam and Eve lost that relationship with God and how Jesus has restored that. And Marty did such a good job of reminding us what, uh, what Jesus has done for us. 
this morning, and uh, that's a dominant theme. And God's people, Israel, and the relationship that God has with that uh, special family and the blessing that he brought uh, through a- Abraham and then eventually through Jesus and, and right through to us. But also this whole concept of this, the return of Jesus it is uh, such a dominant theme in the Bible. Last week we talked about that concept called the rapture, where the word is actually not in, my, in, in the Bible as such, but the concept is where God's people, the bride of Christ, will be taken out of the world. Quite a, it's quite a big theme really, isn't it? It's quite a, a mind-blowing concept to think that uh, one day we're going to all be taken out into meet, meeting the Lord, caught up to be with the Lord in the clouds. And I think there's general agreement uh, with Bible-believing Christians that this event is coming. I think most Bible-believing Christians, it's so clear in, in, the, in the Bible that, that this, is, this is coming. The bigger question, of course, is around the timing of it, and we won't know 100% until we get there. But is this going to happen before the tribulation, during the tribulation, or at the end of the tribulation? That can be a big discussion point in, in, uh, you know, in Christians and theologians and all the rest of it. Last week I explained my own personal understanding has shifted on this. And now I'm quite comfortable with the concept that Jesus is coming for his bride before the seven-year tribulation period, not during, not at the end. And uh, if, you, if you're unsure about why I've come to that conclusion, you look at last week's message, it's all there. But thinking about that, if that's the case, if that is uh, the reality that Jesus is coming before that period of time in history called the tribulation, that means he could come any time. Any time, if he chose, he could come today without warning. And uh, so I guess we need to be ready. That's, that's probably the, the one uh, important theme around this, one important thought, is that if Jesus is coming before any of this stuff unfolds that will give us clear warning and insight and that we're coming to the end, and he could come any time, we need to be ready, don't we? Because we don't know. And uh, <clears throat> when that day will be, and that, the Bible is very clear about that, we will not know the day or the hour. We'll be caught out, just like the people were in the time of Noah and in the time of Lot. They had no idea. They were carrying on with business as normal. They were going to work. They were getting married, and they were having holidays, and they were visiting grandma, and they were doing all the things that they always did. And uh, then that, that moment came, and that, that we were warned. Jesus warned us it's going to be similar. There are some other things to look out for that we have covered during this series that um, just really uh, quite important to have a little bit of a focus on and to understand, uh, but not to camp on. The, these, uh, the situation of the prophesied invasion of Israel by Russia, Turkey, Iran, and Libya that's predicted by the prophet Ezekiel, and I think it's in Ezekiel 38, and actually this could happen any time from now on. So we need to be aware that that's, uh, that could happen. And then there's also, and we talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. The Bible talks about the fact that the daily sacrifices are going to be resumed, and that hasn't been daily sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem for almost 2,000 years because there's been no temple. Uh, so that could happen any time. We need to keep our eyes open in the news for that sort of thing. There's also mention of uh, Babylon. There's possible rebuilding of that city in Iraq. There's also, of course, the prophecies around that we talked about a couple of weeks ago about the Ten Nation Coalition, uh, which will be formed from like a revived Roman Empire with one clear leader who will be like the Roman Emperor who will be initially come as a man of peace. Everyone will love him and he will become a world leader and ultimately a world ruler. And of course, he is known as the Antichrist. And if we get to the point where we see that happening, guess what? 
we're in the tribulation period. And um, I think we've either missed the rapture, or Pastor Roger was wrong about that, and we that is still to come. So we shall see. But I think if we, it's, it's just something to consider. If we start to see these things happening, we need to realize it's actually time to really get serious with God. We should already be serious, but hey, you know, things, things are really speeding up. And we need to dig in and prepare for the challenges ahead because once we see that 10 nation and that leader, we know that the tribulation period, and there's only seven years left, that's begun. And of course, we've learned about the new financial system that he will bring in halfway through, requiring a mark on your hand or your forehead in order to buy and sell. We also learned about the fact that he's, he's going to break the peace treaty that he's organized and daily sacrifices will be stopped. And uh, he's going to set himself up as God in the temple. And that will be a very clear countdown to the return of Jesus, which will be three and a half years. It's mentioned in specifically down to 42 months or even 1,290 days. So we can begin to count down from that period, to, and we will know. There'll be no element of surprise around that um, for people that are aware. And that 1,290 days is based on a Jewish calendar, not ours. So uh, that's why that doesn't equate exactly to three and a half years in our um, Western calendar. We've talked about all that. <coughs> and in the meantime, the big question is, what should we be doing? What sort of people should we be? And how should we live in these times that we're living in? And I, I think, I don't know, I guess we've all got our own opinions around this, but I think it's clear that we, with the birth pains that have been happening through, you know, the last couple of hundred years, particularly, and, and in the last couple of years, I think we clearly are moving towards this sort of time that is prophesied and predicted in the Bible. So how should we live in these times? I think the first thing is that we need to be watchful. We need to be awake. We need to keep an eye on what's happening in the world because we can, we can get in our own little cocoon and in our own little world and um, you know, be oblivious to all sorts of things. But you know, if, if we're awake and aware of what's going on, we, we're not going to be caught out. We're, not, we're going to be actually realizing, yes, uh, Jesus is coming. Things are moving. Things are happening. We're living in an exciting time. And I think we also need to be particularly watchful and aware of what's happening in the Middle East and around Israel, because Israel is, is right at the center of all of this. And I, I think the focus, it's amazing, isn't it? such a small little country and how often it's in the news, almost every day. But I think that's going to happen more and more. The focus as we get closer to this time is going to be more and more on what's happening, even in terms of uh, world news and so on. Last week, we realized that Jesus told several parables relating to this time of his return. And his number one expectation of us and his people and, and what he hopes to find, his, the things that he's hope, hoping to find in us when he returns. And he's hoping to find a people that are ready and not caught out. He's hoping to find people that are watchful and alert and actually active in this time. The, the first parable that we looked at was in Matthew 24, and it outlines Jesus' expectation of those that he leaves in charge of his people, his bride, his church, which was like a word for pastors, for leaders, and the word basically was to faithfully feed and care for the flock. Now, that's what Jesus is looking for when he comes back in his church. He's looking for a healthy church that actually knows and understands the Word of God, people that are growing because they're fed and they're cared for and they love each other. Now, Jesus is looking for all of that in his family when he returns. And uh, the second one, the second parable that we looked at last week was the parable of the bridesmaids. 
You know, remember there was the five wise and the five foolish and the five wise ones had their oil topped up and they were ready when the bridegroom, when the bride and bridegroom came, they were ready to go into the, the celebration, the marriage feast. And the, uh, the analogy, I guess, the message there that Jesus was wanting to bring us, for all of us, is that we need to keep the oil topped up. We need to keep the Holy Spirit alive and overflowing in our lives, don't we? If we get dry, well, then we get weary, and then we start to, you know, we start to get distracted and we, we give up on all the things that we know God's got for us. We keep the oil topped up and the anointing. It's actually like the life. It's just like an, a motor in our car. If we, if we let the oil run dry, it's not long before it starts to huff and puff and finally will seize and stop. And so Jesus does not want us to seize in the, in the, in the moment. He wants us to actually uh, stay active and working well and enjoying life and, and, and uh, reaching our potential. The very next parable that we're going to look at today in Matthew chapter 25, and remember these were four parables that Jesus told right on top of the time when he had been talking to his disciples about his return. So this is, these parables link right back into what Jesus was talking about in, in, in terms of his return and his, his second coming. <clears throat> and it's called the parable of the bags of gold. We might be more familiar with it as the parable of the talents. So let's read it. Again, I will be like a man going, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. You see, just as Jesus said again, it's, it links it to the other parables that we've already looked at and um, about when, when Jesus goes away and what he expects to find when he returns. The, he, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And then, of course, the, the same thing. We're not going to read the whole parable. The same thing happened for the man who had received two bags of gold. He doubled it to four. And once again, the master, when he, when he realized that this, this guy had worked hard and done, done well, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. And then we go down to verse 24, the, to, uh, and we learn about the man who had received one bag of gold, and when he came, the one who had hidden the gold and done nothing with it. This is his master's response to a do-nothing attitude. It's actually quite important. From verse 26, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Clearly, this parable is re referring to Jesus as the master who has gone on a journey. So it's, it's referring to Jesus having left this earth and the fact he's entrusted things to us, his servants. He's entrusted his wealth to his servants. And one day he's coming back to take account. And I think there are potentially several layers to this parable. I think there's three types of wealth 
that we actually receive from Jesus that God has entrusted to us. First of all, there's the resources or the money that God has entrusted to us, isn't there? That's the natural level. In the parable, just so we get a little bit of a picture about it, these bags of gold, which was, uh, it was called a talent, which was a weight at back then. It wasn't about our gifts and abilities in that sense. It was a weight and a measure of, of uh, anything, but particularly relating to gold. And it was a 30 kilogram weight that Jesus was talking about. And if you think about a 30 kilogram bag of gold, and I looked up yesterday and the price of gold fluctuates every day, every hour, every minute probably, and I think it actually went down a bit yesterday, but it's probably gone up again today. Uh, but at the moment, a 30 kilogram bag of gold is worth approximately 95,000 New Zealand dollars per kilo. And if there were 30 kilos in a bag, that means that one bag of gold was worth $2.9 million, almost $3 million in one bag of gold. And Jesus uh, gave you know, one bag to one guy, two bags to another, and five to another. You, you know, the, the, two, the guy that got two bags, he got $5.8 million worth of gold. Quite a bit. The guy that got five bags, he got between 14 and 15 million. Just to those three guys, the, the, uh, the master gave out approximately $30 million worth of gold, just to three of them. And the parable indicates that actually uh, we're all servants, and there's billions of us now. So how much wealth has the master got? It almost reminds me a little bit of, you know, who owns a cattle on a thousand hills? God does. You know, his wealth is unlimited. This gives us a picture of a very, very wealthy master, and a master who is generous with his wealth and trusting to, towards his servants, isn't it? I mean, how many of us would give a servant, you know, 50 bucks, let alone, <laughs> let alone uh, 14 or 15 million. Um, but that's our master. That's what Jesus is like. He's entrusting us with all his wealth and all his uh, blessings. And uh, in turn, because he's so trusting to us, he expects us actually to be responsible and to do something with the resources that he places in our hands, right? That's what this parable is about. And he, I think Jesus expects us to be people that work hard, right? You know, there's a bit of a temptation when we start to think about, well, the rapture's coming. And what's the point of getting a degree? What's the point of going to university for five years and working hard? Or what's the point of starting a business when we start from scratch and, and it's going to take five, 10, 20 years to really build up this thing? We could, have, we could live as Christians, well, you know, the rapture's coming anyway. And we could just, as, as the old saying goes, we could just sort of hang out at the rapture bus stop and do nothing with our life, couldn't we? But this parable shows us that actually Jesus expects us to do something with the resources that he's placed in our hands. And if he's given us the ability actually to go to university and to get a degree and to do something uh, productive with our life, he expects us to be doing that. And if, if, the, if he returns in the middle of us doing our degree and we don't quite get our business set up, does that actually matter? It actually matters that we're doing something with what he's entrusted to us. That's the point here, I think. And he expects us to grow what he has given us rather than squandering it. And he also expects us to use what he's entrusted to us to bless others. And we need to realize it's not just all about us. But that's, that's at one level. And as we do that, as we handle what he has entrusted, the resources, the ability to work, the ability to run a business, the ability to 
get a degree and, and be a lawyer or an engineer or whatever God has placed in our hearts, whatever, or be in government. What an awesome thing to aspire to, to being the prime minister. Wouldn't that be cool? But I tell you what, it's going to be, it's not going to happen in a day. It's probably going to take you a long time to get to that, uh, to that place. But we've got, to, we've got to have vision. We've got to have goals. We've got to do some work. We've got to do the mahi, don't we? Otherwise, we're going to find that our, we'll just drift through life and we'll get to the other end and we'll have nothing to show for all the resource that, that Jesus has placed in our hands. And, and we, we don't want to hear the words, depart from me, you wicked, lazy servant, do we? Jesus expects us to do what we can with what he's given us. And the parable he's given us here, and as we do that, he can trust us with more. Isn't that cool thought? He can trust us with more. Of course, that's just the natural level in this parable. As well as resources and the ability to work, God has entrusted every single one of us with spiritual giftings, hasn't he? We've all got giftings, and they're all different. If we went around this room and we could identify the spiritual giftings that Jesus has given to all of us, that probably most of them would be different. And uh, because these are giftings that the Holy Spirit gives us, these are, the, these are the, the, the bags of gold that God has invested in you and me, and they're abilities to, in, the, in the natural, but they're also abilities in the spiritual. We've got giftings. I mean, let's just think about a few of them. Some, some people up here have got musical ability to lead us in worship and song, and, and um, I haven't got that. Some of us have got the ability to, you know, to, in hospitality to really make people feel welcome in this place. Others have got giftings of leadership and administration. Others have got teaching giftings. We've got team of teams of people out there right now teaching the kids. They've got, they've got giftings that they can relate to these kids. And apparently they're out there today, they're, they're doing some baking or something interesting. Now that'll be cool, won't it, if they come back in with some baking for us. But we've, we've, got, uh, we've got people who can uh, raise and encourage and train up our youth. We've got people that can speak and preach, and next week we, we're going to have Brendan, and he's got a gift of teaching. We're going we're gonna to be blessed by that. We've got people in our church here that have got the gift of intercession, people that can pray things through to a conclusion. We need to use the giftings that God's got for us. And other people have got the gifting of encouragement or giving or caring and mercy and, or evangelism to share the good news. All the gifts, and there's hundreds of them actually, there's a lot more than this. This is just a bit of a quick overview. All these gifts God has placed in us, in His church, so that His work can grow. That's the reason. So that as a church, we don't just get putter out and get smaller and have less influence. He wants us to grow. Healthy things should grow. And uh, I believe God's wanting us as a church to really work together, to using our gifts to see his church grow, his bride uh, becoming awesome. And thirdly, there's another little layer that I want to mention here, is, is that Jesus has placed pure gold within each of us, over and above our resources and our giftings and our abilities. He has placed that gift of salvation, hasn't he, in each and every one of us. He's given us his grace. He's given us, actually, when you think about it, what Jesus has placed inside of us is like a touch of heaven, isn't it? He's, he's, we're connected to the Father. It's like a touch of heaven inside every single one of us. We have, you and I have eternity in our hearts. Did you know that? We've got eternity within us. And the question is, like the resources and the giftings that God has placed in our lives, what are we doing with the pure gold that God has placed in you and me? What are we doing with it? The forgiveness, the salvation, the unconditional love, the grace that Jesus has given us, 
What is Jesus going to find that we have done with that when he returns? What's he going to find? Have we grown his grace in our lives? Have we got his, more of his goodness? And are we sharing it? Are we sharing it with our family? Are we sharing his love? Like what Marty was talking about. We're sharing about how Jesus wants to throw the rope out and pull us out of the quicksand. And there's lots and lots of people in this community right now that are struggling and battling in the quicksand. Instead of coming up, they're going down, aren't they? And we know the answer is Jesus. Are we communicating that with them? That's, the, that's what Jesus, that's the sort of thing Jesus is looking for when he comes back. He's going to say, you know, PJ, how are you, go, how are you going with reaching people? You know, well done. Robert, how are you going? With your, you're doing a good job. Well done. And, and so on. Peter, bus driving, you're out there every day and you're, you're representing Jesus. Well done. You know, it's not always the big stuff. It's the everyday stuff that Jesus is looking for. He's looking for how we are at work. He's looking at how we are when we relate to people. You know, are we sharing his grace and his goodness and his love? I'm sure we are. And I've picked out two or three and I could go around the room, but uh, let's keep doing it. This next parable actually is the most challenging of all because it gives us an idea of the how-to. Let's read it. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 36. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. So clearly this is a, a, another parable relating to when Jesus comes back. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, this is Jesus speaking about himself, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was... Isn't that interesting? Now God's had all this on his mind since the creation of the world. You know, God wasn't caught out when Adam and Eve rebelled and sinned and, and all the things that's happened over the last five, six thousand odd years through world history. Now, God hasn't been surprised by it all because he had a plan right from the beginning, and that was to, uh, through Jesus. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. It's quite challenging, isn't it? It's quite challenging, this stuff. What did Jesus say to those on his left, the goats? In verse 41, we'll pick it up down there. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. Of course, Jesus was referring to those in need around us and our willingness to help them. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Because I guess we struggle. We struggle with this concept. Because as we know, in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. We know that our salvation is not dependent on works. That's what we know, isn't it? It's a, it's a gift that we receive. And yet here's Jesus saying that actually it is dependent on how you live as well. To understand this parable, I think it's helpful if we remember who Jesus was talking to. He was talking in Matthew 24 and 25 when he 
outlines the events leading up to his return and what he expected to find when he came back. He was speaking to who? He was speaking to his disciples, and they were a small group of people who already believed. They, they, they believed in Jesus. They had left everything behind, and they'd followed him now for about three, three and a half years. These guys were serious about, you know, receiving Jesus as their, as their Lord and their Savior. And uh, really, what Jesus was saying to them was, you guys already believe, but I expect an outworking of your faith in, over your life. And to summarize what Jesus expects to find here at Surfside when he returns, I just want to quickly go back over these parables. I, I believe Jesus expects to find a church here when he comes that is healthy and growing, right? Because, because the leaders are teaching the Word of God and feeding the flock. We need to come to church to be fed. We also need to be feeding ourselves the Word of God. We need to be praying. We need to be reading. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit personally. But we, as a church, we should be healthy and we should be growing. And also Jesus, when he comes back to Surfside, Raglan, what he expects to find is a people who are full and overflowing with the Holy Spirit, right? Like the five wise bridesmaids. And he also expects us, like in the parable of the talents or the bags of gold, he expects us to be faithful and diligent and hardworking with the resources God has given us, right? That's what he's expecting to find when he comes back. Not people that are drifting around. I remember when I, when I was at high school and, uh, you know, there were some guys that were, they were the cool guys at school and they used to sneak off because I was at boarding school. They'd come out to Raglan and they would surf. And their, I remember them saying their goal and their mission in life was to go on the dole, to go out and live on the beach at Raglan and surf surf their life away. That was their vision for their life. Now, I'm not against surfing. I think it's, it's an awesome activity and it's healthy and all the rest of it. But if that's the vision for your life, I remember thinking all those years ago, come on, guys, is that really a vision for your life, to go on the dole? And that's what Jesus doesn't want us just to waste our life. He wants us to have a meaningful life an awesome life, a fulfilling life, a life of purpose, and to use the resources that he's given us, to use the gifts and the anointing and the, for the corporate good. He wants the church to grow and influence the community. He wants us as his people that have got an investment of pure gold in us. He wants us to share that salvation, the treasure to others around us, and to be ones that not only know it all in our heads. You know, sometimes Christianity and you can get into a lot of theology and we could go from after the series and we could say, okay, now we know all about the second coming. We know about the Antichrist. We know about the tribulation. We know about the rapture. We know about it all. We've got it all worked out in our heads and we're watching the news and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and that's awesome. But Jesus also wants us to be out there on the coalface of life in this community and not just being full of theology and information and knowledge that doesn't translate into everyday life. He wants us to live a powerful life every day and he wants us to be sharing his love and bringing help to people that need help. He wants us to be bringing hope to people that need hope. He wants us to be making a difference in, in people that are struggling. And he wants us to be practical with that help day after day. And what, when you think about it, what Jesus is really talking about that he's looking for in you and me is a spirit of selflessness, isn't it, really? He wants us to use the giftings. He wants us to grow. He wants us to be successful in business. He wants us to realize that, hey, it's not all about 
you make. It's actually about the people that you can bless through your business. It's about the people that, about the church that you can help to grow through your giftings. And it's about the people that actually are going to come to faith because they hear about the gold that's in your, in your heart that, and the love you have for Jesus. And uh, <laughs> that's the challenge. And I, I believe the spirit of selflessness that Jesus was talking about when we see someone that's, that's hungry to feed them, when we see someone that's thirsty to give them a drink, when we see someone that's struggling to help them across the street, whatever it might be, I believe what Jesus is saying here is that's what will break open this community to my love. What do you reckon? I think that's what's going to, it's not the theory, it's not the knowledge so much. It's the, it's the day-to-day stuff, and that can be the hard stuff. A couple of final thoughts as we conclude our series. I don't know about you guys, but I've noticed that Jesus is taking a while to come back. Have you noticed? I think we could even begin to think that Jesus is reluctant to come. He's taking so long. Or perhaps we could start to think he's not too bothered about coming back. Goodness me, there's so many problems and things he's going to have to sort out. And imagine ruling the world and sorting out all the things, all the mess that's going to need sorting out after the tribulation. But I want to say to you guys, and I'm sure you're aware of this, I believe nothing could be further from the truth. Because I I believe Jesus is intensely interested in everything that's going on. And, um, you know, the other day I was downtown, I was talking to our friend Lisa. And uh, she said, because she's been listening online, she said, Roger, if Jesus comes back at the rapture and then he's coming back at the end, that means he's coming back not twice but three times. And she's right. I went home and I talked to Cheryl about this and she said, oh, no, actually... Jesus is not coming just three times, he's coming four times. Because if you think about it, he came the first time as a sacrifice and he was dead and he was in the tomb and he was gone and then he had a resurrection and he came back. So that's one, two. And then if he's coming back at the rapture, which is where we're going to all be caught up, that's before the tribulation. So that'll be the third time. And then at the end, he's coming for the fourth time. It's interesting, isn't it? And I was thinking about it. I also want to add in that Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has been giving people down through the centuries dreams and visions of himself. And even today, all around the world, we hear stories of Muslim people who are having visions of Jesus and coming to faith in him. Rather than being distant and not interested, I, it, the Bible tells us that Jesus is interceding for you and me day and night. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's saying to the Father, hey, have you noticed the guys at Surfside and Raglan? They've had some struggles. They're working through. They're trying to reach the community, but they've had some battles. Let's really see a breakthrough for these guys. And, and the Father, yes, let's. Let's see some good stuff happening uh, in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Let's, let's bless that place. And also, I think that Jesus is hanging out on the balcony of heaven, cheering us on. When someone comes to faith that we know and love, and we've shared that little bit of gold in our heart to someone, and they start, the lights start to come on. I think Jesus is cheering us on. Come on, guys. That's awesome. Well done. I believe Jesus celebrates every salvation and every change and every shift for good that comes through his people, his church. And he's even passing on messages of encouragement for us. Did you guys know that? He is passing on messages of encouragement to us as a church. And I want to remind you of one of them through the Holy Spirit and through prophetic words. I want to finish this series with a recent prophetic word that I believe Jesus has given us as a church. So listen to this guy. This was through David and Greta Peters, the prophets that came back in March and April. They came and spoke online, 
and some of you, you could probably go back and find that there. They also came and spoke to our leaders, <coughs> and this is the word that they had for us back in April, uh, a few months ago, for Surfside Church in Raglan. This is a message from Jesus for us right now, and this is what he says. These are troubled times, and you have not been immune to them. You have felt the buffeting of national and global circumstances, and you have known the weariness they bring. While these things have come from Satan, God has been at work in you. That's us. Deepening your trust in him, you have had to draw deeper from him. Just as a tree has to put down deeper roots in drought, searching for water. You know, we've, we've had to pray through some stuff. We've had to work through some stuff over the last couple of years and the last few months. Your root system has been strengthened. This is a word for us as a church. And it is not obvious because the trunk and the branches of the tree still look distressed. This was back in April, but it's probably still true now. There is a time lag between the roots becoming stronger and the branches becoming stronger. But know that the deeper roots will, will draw purer water. And as it flows in these next few years, you will see the tree of this church flourish. And then in capital letters, they've written, you are going to flourish. That's a word for us as a church. We are going to flourish in this community against all the resistance, against all the odds, against all the obstacles. And even though we haven't even got our own church building right now for us all together and together, we're going to flourish. We're going to flourish. That's the word of God. To flourish, <coughs> he, he go, they go on to explain what that means. To flourish means to be in a vigorous state to thrive, to be in one's prime, to be at the height of influence. Strangely, it also means to sound a trumpet call or a fanfare. You are going to sound the alarm to the lost in this area through the gospel. Warn them what is coming and how they can escape the day of judgment. People will be more open than they have ever been, as global shaking will continue through this decade. People come and people go. Do not worry about those who have left you. Now, I notice we've got a few dairy farmers missing at the moment, but we're trusting that that's just a season, and we're looking forward to them all coming back. Do not worry about those who have left. They're just dairy farmers who are coming back. I had that. God will gather others. In fact, be prepared for growth. As greater freedom bring, comes in these next few years, people are going to come out of hiding, both fearful Christians and non-believers. And then they gave a word for us as a, as a church from Hosea 2 verse 15. This is a, a Bible verse. It's a word that God is injecting into your spiritual DNA. It'll be up on the screen. I will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. Isn't that an awesome promise that Jesus is giving us as a church? I'm let's say that again. I, let's say it together. Jesus says to us at Surfside right now, I will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. Isn't that cool? Let's say it again just to really get it in our spirit this morning. Jesus says, I will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. And then they end up, yeah, let's give Jesus a clap for that. <laughs> then they finish their prophetic word with, uh, you know, declare this like we have and pray it into being and meditate on it. And as you do, you will look back in years to come and see that this season, 2020 to 2022, has been a defining moment in your history as a church. Isn't that cool? What, isn't it awesome to think that Jesus is so interested 
in you and me. He's interested in our everyday life. He's interested in our salvation. He's interested in our church and our relationships. And he wants to grow us. He wants to bless us. He wants to prosper us, not just for ourselves, but so that we can be a blessing to others like Abraham was and still is today. And the most exciting thing of all is that he is coming back. And it might not be too far away. So let's make sure that we are ready for, for him when he comes. So bless you guys. That's, uh, that's our series. <laughs> How about if we stand and really worship? Let's really worship Jesus today as we conclude this time. Anyone would like some prayer today? Anyone would like to give their life to Jesus? Anyone that wants some prayer for healing? Anyone that's down and discouraged and you might want to have a bit of a lift in your heart today? Just step out if, if there's any needs at all.